Hi, my name is Dr. Richmond Lowe and I'm the fish vet. Today we're investigating some possible causes for ill thrift or skinniness in this community tank in our background here. Before we get started, I'd like to share with you that we've got a new Facebook fan page. It's a better platform for those of you who are asking me questions about your sick fish. On the Facebook fan page, you're able to post up videos and photos of your sick fish so that I can get a better idea of what your problem might be. Also, on the fan page, we're gonna be posting, or we have been posting, photos and videos of interesting cases and it'll help you be more aware of how to spot fish diseases and we also provide practical tips on how to keep your fish healthier and live much longer, happier lives. So have a look down in the comments below for the link to our Facebook fan page. Now back to this video. Paul from Morley Aquariums has this beautiful display tank full of African cichlids in his retail store. He has invited me to come and visit to investigate why some of the fish in his tank, in particular some species in this tank, is presenting with emaciation over time. In this next clip, Paul's going to talk through some of the species that he's keeping and point out the species that are being affected. We've got uh, the Victorian cichlids. Uh, they were previously Hapochromus, but these days they go under different names like Astolapia, Pandamila, all sorts, but they're, they're haplochromides. Uh, this is a haplochromide here. This guy's still in pretty good condition. Um, it tends to happen more as they get older and dominant and start to fight a bit. Uh, this is another one up here. You can see he's starting to sort of just hollow out a little. Uh, that one there is what they call a species 44, the reddish coloured one in the background there. Uh, very similar to flamebacks, which suffer the similar thing. Uh, probably the ones we find most affected are one called the hippo point salmon which Richmond's got a picture of a pinkish coloured front on them, salmon colour. Uh, they tend to struggle. There's another Victorian, you can see he's getting a little bit hollow down here. That would be a flame back, that one. Um, the other fish we've got in there would be a, a lot of your peacocks. There's your peacock there, peacock there, peacock here, peacock here, peacock here, um, peacock here. They generally tend to be pretty good. Really only the ones at the bottom of the pecking order tend to struggle, if anything, but they're normally quite quite good. Uh, we've got some haplochromides which are things like Placid uh, Protomelis Red Empress doing quite well. Um, the borley eyes seem to usually do very well which are Copetochromus species, Copetochromus borley eyes. Uh, we do have things like Cyanochromus Electric Blues. Uh, Pseudotrophius which are all these round robust looking guys. Again, your young ones, nice and healthy, do very well. Okay, If they start getting dominated um, and they start getting very big, like the cobalt zebra at the back there, which is Pseudotrophius um, calianus, or cobalt zebra. That's when they tend to, tend to start to struggle and drop their weight off. Uh, or ones that are right at the bottom, bottom of the pecking order can struggle as well sometimes. Uh, we do have some fish like Tanganyukans in there, like your Trophius species, and a black calvus there, um, Kendali. You know, while Tanganyikas are supposed to be very sensitive and your trophies are supposed to be very touchy, we get very few problems with those guys. The only issues we get with them is them killing each other because they are very aggressive towards each other. Um, this guy here has been getting battered by that guy, so it's not a, not a uh, gut problem or anything with that guy. And they are a fish that is probably one of the most prone to Malawi bloat. In fact, they call it trophies bloat. Okay? Um, we've even got some uh, Raganis at the back there, which are uh, Gilidochroma species, doing absolutely fine in there. Um, what else have I got going on in there? Um, so lots of the small fish, the small peacocks and things, the young ones all do well. It's when they get a bit older and a bit dominant that we tend to start to run into problems with them. And it's funny because the fish that you'd think would get the gut problems last, get them earlier. Now we do have melanochroma species, which are these guys. Very aggressive species. All the melanochromas are very aggressive. Um, generally tend to do very well. Um, really only the, the the whipping boys are the ones that might get a problem in them. The rest of them do quite fine. Whipping boys? The ones that get beaten up the most. Uh, right. Mm. All right. And there's always one or two that uh, bottom of the pecking order that you know, get knocked around a bit. They're the only ones that tend to struggle with those guys. The clown loaches, just about always healthy, just about always doing well. Very rarely get a problem with the clown loaches. We've got lots of catfish in there, mainly Cynodonta species. No problems at all with them. They're great. Um, Rostratus coming around here at the side here with the spots and a bit of a scratch. 
Now rostratus are a very difficult fish to keep good weight on in all sorts of situations. They're a fish that uh, are a bottom sifter um, in the lake themselves that digs big pits in the lake so they're feeding constantly all the time. They get followed around by fish called blue followers which are things like Mortaria, Certicara, uh, sorry, uh, the uh, Placidromus electras, the um, Certicara morii, um, most of the um, other Placidromus species all tend to follow those guys around, the gazelles and things like that, and they follow around, pick through the pits, but the Rostratus themselves can be very hard to keep weight on. Okay. Um, I think it's because they need that constant feeding, which is very hard to achieve mm. without murking up a tank. <coughs> okay. So small and ones are great, the, um, big ones are good. They're competing with a clown loaches. They would be, yeah. Because uh, like would that be. one you, is you, like you eating too feed, much. You rarely feed, <laughs> see them feeding through the bottom like you would naturally. Yeah, right. um, again, young ones do well. It's when they get older and they have that higher food requirement, it does start to get quite hard. To and keep what sort of healthy. substrate do they have, like, would this be too coarse maybe for them to be sick? Oh, I don't think so. I mean, you, when you see them eating in there, they, they generally tend to be able to, um, you know, eat pretty big, get pretty big mouthfuls of gravel and spit it out and things like that. But there mm. is certainly a fair bit of competition in there. And you, in a, in a confined tank like this, you wonder how much muck they get in their feces and other crap rather than actual you know, mm. quality food. Um, so it can be quite difficult to keep those guys fed up quite well. Uh, but we do our best. We know we try and vary the diet a little bit. We give them a bit of fresh foods. We give them a lot of pellets, um, flakes, all sorts of different things to try and get through. We never throw in big foods. It's always lots of small, fine ones, so they do tend to have to work for it. Um, but it's uh, yeah, never easy to manage a big tank like this. That one there's uh, Lombardi, doing fine. Any other species here we haven't talked about? Um, look, they're, they're all generally variations on those same themes. Um, they all fall in the same sort of categories. You know, that's another peacock there. Uh, Idotrophius is sort of a Cytotrophius type fish. I think that covers most of the species that we've got going on there. There are a few of the bigger predators in there. Like this sort of guy here, um, which I'm making a complete mental blank on his name. Uh, it's not Tetracanthus. Uh, oh, mental blank. Yeah, one of those. Okay. <laughs> yeah, big dude there. Um, he seems to do okay. Yeah, nice big streamers like that. It's good. We've actually just changed to a, a new food we're trialling at the moment. Um, we've been using Spectrum for a long time. We've actually switched on to another one called Extreme. Mm. We're seeing how that goes. Uh, and we always use a lot of Cereflora. And they do get a fair bit of frozen fruit, like brine shrimp and things as well. Mice shrimp and brine shrimp. Skinniness in fish can be due to several causes such as intestinal parasites, poor nutrition and chronic diseases such as mycobacteriosis. To investigate this case, we use a process of elimination. I was able to exclude nutritional causes because the fish were seen eating adequate amounts of good quality and a varied diet. I was able to eliminate the possibility of intestinal parasites because seven months ago I formulated a diet that I got the compounding pharmacy to make that contained levamazole for nematodes and metronidazole for intestinal flagellates and after feeding that diet for a month there were no signs of improvement. The next step was to look at the water quality parameters. In Paul's tank there were fish from the three different lakes, Lake Malawi, Lake Tanganyika, and Lake Victoria. We noticed that the worst affected fish were all from Lake Victoria. So we referred to Tarling and Tarling's chemical composition chart for African Rift Lake cichlids and found there were major differences in the calcium and magnesium levels between the three lakes. So I tested the calcium and magnesium levels in Paul's tank and found that the levels in his tank were much higher than that in Lake Victoria. So here's a chart so that you can see the comparison. You can see that the calcium and magnesium levels in Paul's tank deviated greatly from that in Lake Victoria but most closely resembled that of Lake Tanganyika. The most important parameter to note is the magnesium levels. Magnesium is used medically as a diuretic or a cathartic and it can negatively affect the fish's digestive system if it's not used to high levels in the water over time. 
So the solution for the problem is for Paul to stop using the reflex cichlid salts and to perform massive water changes to decrease the levels of calcium and magnesium in his tank. I'd like to note that Paul was using a well-known brand of reflex cichlid salts and that he was following the manufacturer's instructions. In conclusion, this case shows that it's very important to test magnesium levels on their own, especially if you're keeping a mixed African cichlid tank and to only use buffers if you need to raise the levels to within the optimal limits. Given that the magnesium levels in Lake Tanganyika are so much higher than that in Lake Malawi and Lake Victoria, it is recommended that Lake Tanganyikan cichlids be kept on their own in a separate aquarium if you wish to keep them in water parameters most closely suited to that of their natural environment. Great, so, well, that's all from me. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to get updates of our future videos and have a fantastic week.